good evening and welcome to Getting Kids to Play Outside, a Loudoun County Public Library program in partnership with the Loudoun Wildlife Conservancy. I'm Lorraine Moffa, Programming Coordinator at Loudoun County Public Library and your host tonight. Please feel free to send me your comments and questions by typing them in the chat box and I'll relay them to our presenter during or after the program. It's my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Megan Goldman, Youth and Family Program Coordinator at Loudoun Wildlife Conservancy. Megan was born and raised in Western Loudoun, and after 20 years away, she's moved back to the area so her two young boys can explore and play in the same woods that she did as a child. Her experience as an engineer in commercial nuclear power plants has made her aware of the importance of developing STEM skills. She believes that free play, nature exploration, and child-led interaction with materials in the wild are some of the most powerful ways for children to develop these skills while also growing up to be dedicated environmental stewards. With this in mind, Megan is hoping to set up programs for youth and families that focus on getting kids to connect with nature on their own terms and in their own way. Welcome, Megan. Hi there, thank you for the intro, Lorraine. Sure. Okay, hi everybody. Thanks for, thanks for tuning in. This is one of my favorite topics uh, because I've spent a long time, let me just say I have two boys who are now 10 and 12 years old and uh, there were a lot of tears and a lot of bribes at first trying to figure out how to get my kids outside when I had this vision of how we should all be enjoying nature. And so I've put together this presentation based on all of the wrong things that I've done and all of the um, the good ideas that I think are pretty universal. Okay, so let's start. Let me start by figuring out how to move forward the slide. Let's see. There we go. Okay, so first of all, we need to back up before we start kicking our kids outside. Why go outside in the first place? Um, these are some three in my opinion, pretty good reasons. Number one is your sanity because being a parent is is hard. And let me just say that I would, I, I still do find any way I can to make it a little bit easier. And what I found out through trial and error is that being a parent outdoors, um, especially in a natural or a wild setting is way easier. And why is that? It's it's easier to manage kids in a natural setting because there's less less stuff that breaks and there's more room for them to run around. Um, and then their sanity, I feel like kids end up being a bit happier outside just based on the fact that you're more sane because you're not yelling them at them as much. And then they know that they can be rowdier outside. So they feel less uh, internal stress trying to keep it together and trying to follow the rules, if they are trying to follow the rules, which my children don't always try and follow the rules. Um, and then I think they're they're also happier out there because there's a lot going on to see. Um, and most of it at their level, at kid level, is touchable. They're allowed to go up and touch things, which, you know, indoor settings, if you think about the experience of a kid, a lot of a lot of what they hear is, oh no, not for touching. Oh, don't touch that. But in nature, they don't have that experience. And then it's also always changing. It's always dynamic with the seasons. Leaves are falling, um, different plants are growing, different stages. There's always something new to go and look at. And then lastly, the good for brains and bodies. And this holds for both little people and big people. So study after study after study is now coming out with the research to back up what I feel like we all pretty much understood um, that going outside is good for us. Um, in terms of uh, the kids, their neurologic development, um, their, their, um, their ability to actually achieve academically increases with, with the amount of nature time that they have. Um, and then also their bodies, they are able to have much, uh, many more sensory experiences, um, in a natural setting. There's so much going on in nature as we talked about. <clears throat> and then their, um, mathematical and verbal abilities also have been proven to go up with their time in nature. And then as far as adults go, I mean, the same, the same basic things hold there as well. It's stimulating it, it, it feeds your senses. 
Um, they're also finding all of these uh, these medical conditions that can be positively influenced, whether it's a decrease in inflammation or decrease in cortisol levels. Um, all of these things have been leading to a new resurgence of trying to get people outside having, um, I think they call them park RXs, so doctors prescribe time in nature. All right, so hopefully that's the quick reason why everybody should be going outside. Now we'll get into the meat of the presentation, which is I'm going to give you five tips and tricks to get the kids outside. Okay. Oh, and I think Lorraine mentioned, if you guys have any questions, um, you can feel free to put them in the chat box and Lorraine will, um, interrupt me. We'll stop me in my tracks and, and we can start going through them or, uh, at the end, I also have room for questions as well. Okay. So tip number 1 is that you should go outside. And I know that sounds ridiculous, but it really works. And I like to think of this as a little bit of parenting a keto, which I've never taken a keto. I've never actually done any martial arts, but from what I hear, um, a keto uh, uses the energy of the opponent against them. So you don't necessarily have to uh, outmatch them in terms of strength, but you just turn turn their their strength to use against them. So. We all know as a parent that your children can always hunt you down and find you. Every time you try and have a quiet moment or read a book, they hunt you down. So if you would like your children to be outside more, you go outside and they will follow you. Um, now, that sounds easy, but we all know how hard it can be to get yourself outside. And one of the big stumbling blocks for me, at least, was that I was miserable when I was outside. Um, that sounds horrible. But for example, in the summer, it's really hot. Um, I am one of those people that goes outside for five minutes and I get eaten alive by mosquitoes. So I had to figure out ways um, to prevent myself from being miserable from the get-go. So um, this right here, I've got, I've got props. I don't think I warned you, but I'm gonna do some show and tell. So one thing that I do when I'm outside is I have a big fan, like a construction grade, Ban you can get at any big box store like Lowe's or Home Depot, and we keep several of these outside around um, to just make it that much easier. And also, when I get up in the morning um, and getting ready for the day, I have a little tub of I think this one's called Forager's Balm. And instead of putting lotion on my skin, um, like after the shower or whatever, I put this stuff on, and it's basically like a bug spray balm, and that way. You know, starting at eight o'clock in the morning, I've already got my bug proofness on so that as the urge hits me, I go outside and it's not one more thing I need to think of. Um, Megan, can you tell us what that is? We can't really see the label. This one, it's called, it, this one's called Forager's Balm. It's by a company called Living Libations. And I think, I mean, I don't know, I'm not an entomologist. Um, but I think that everybody's body chemistry is different. And so you kind of have to do a bunch of trial and error with what bug spray works on you. So this was one that I found um, if I put on in the morning, I was, <laughs> I only had, let's say like four or five bug bites by the end of the day, as opposed to like 28. Okay. Um, now winter, uh, real quick about winter misery. I'm one of those people that's always cold. It's like I was not meant to be outside. I get eaten alive by bugs. I'm always hot. I'm cold in the winter. But I found this is my trick for going outside in the winter. I, we call it in my house magic um, our onesies. <laughs> uh, it's basically an insulated coverall, and you know Carhartt makes them. Several other places make them as well, and it just slips right on over your clothes and. Um, on the legs, there's side zippers that go up so you can, you know, you don't even have to take your shoes on to put them on, take your shoes off to put them on. And it makes all the difference in the world, all the difference. It's so nice for me when I go outside now, I may look ridiculous, but I don't care. I am warm. And then one other hint for the winter is this, which is hard because it's in a black fabric, but it's a balaclava. Do not ask me to spell that please. But basically it's a hood that um, that you just put on that's not necessarily attached to a coat or to the suit 
and it also serves as a scarf as well. And then when you don't need a hood anymore, you just put it down and it just bunches around your neck. And that way you're not always dealing with where did I put my hat or do I need to take my scarf off? Um, and both of these things, both the suit and the balaclava I use for my kids. They both have their own assigned suit each winter. They get passed down um, every year or two, and then they have their assigned headgear as well. All right, so that was all to be unmiserable. And then the second thing is to do stuff outside. Um, you know, a lot of people have outdoor hobbies like gardening or birding, um, hiking. I didn't, I still don't really. So I just take my regular stuff that I would be doing inside the house and I figure out how to do it outside the house. So oftentimes that means taking my laptop outside to do, um, to do emails or attend webinars kind of like this. Right now, for instance, I'm outside, I'm in, I call it my driveway office, but it's a camper van and um, I have both ends open. Um, <clears throat> And I, but I've also heard of other people doing, doing things and setting things up outside, um, whether it's crafting or reading. The main thing is to just be comfortable going outside and doing your regular thing and getting your kids used to finding you outside. All right, so that was tip number one. So let's go to tip number two, put fun stuff outside. This is one of my favorite things. So loose parts, that's the, that's the fancy, um, fancy term for random items that kids can play with. Now they're not toys, but they're 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 also kid friendly enough. So what do I mean by that? Well, in nature there are things that um, may already be existing in a green space. So pine cones or pebbles, leaves, sticks, any things that kids can pick up in multiples and carry around with them. Um, now, these are things that you won't necessarily find on a park playground. You know, you may have wood chips there, but but if you think about a playground, there's the built play structures and the kids go up there and they start running around and playing around and they have fun, but it starts getting boring and old because you, it's not dynamic. You can't change it. But when you go into nature, you can build things and, and um, move some of these loose parts around. Now, what I like to do is to augment with some more loose parts. And um, this is my bin it's milk crate which works as a great container because as long as you get the heavy duty ones um they're pretty kid indestructible and then when you put in the loose parts when they're done especially if there's been water involved they have plenty of holes so it drains out um so let's see so uh the core foundation that i like to use is things from the kitchen so i go to you know, thrift stores or Salvation Army, and I go back to the kitchenware section and I just start grabbing um, pots and pans, strainers. Ooh, can you guys see? This one has holes in it. Um, spatulas, uh, cookie sheets, muffin tins, all of these things. I try to stick with all metal just because I found when you get plastic things um, and they're outdoors, they tend to get pretty brittle with the UV light from the sun and then they start snapping and cracking. So by now my collection is almost primarily all metal, but I think that's, but that's because my kids have broken all the plastic stuff. So learn from my mistakes. All right, and so some of the other things that I have in here, speaking of plastic, sorry, I lied. I do have a plastic, I do have a metal funnel somewhere. I don't know where it is. Um, so a funnel, here we have a garden trowel, and then just other random bits, like I have a pulley in here and some rope. I, I mean, I'll just go to Ace Hardware or Home Depot and I just wander around the aisles and I'm like, oh, I bet my kids would like to mess around with that stuff. Um, I have some clear tubing that they like to pipe water through, which is always fun. And then I've got PVC, more plastic. I'm a liar twice now. So we get PVC piping. What is this, one inch or three quarter inch? And you just cut it up into sections that are um, easy enough for your kids to, to um, build with. And then you get the corresponding little fittings like these elbows, and then the kids can just pop them together. I even have a valve right here. 
and then they build little little contraptions to send water every which way. Um, let's see. So here I also have things. These are the things that you don't think about, but kids when they need to secure things. Um, tape is kind of a pain for kids. I mean, it's a pain for adults too, right? Because it sticks to everything and you got to have four hands to try and get everything right. Now, I like to use little clips. Here, I'll try and get these right for you guys to see. So these little squeezy clips, but you have to be careful because I got these and then I really, my kids were like, oh, we don't like these. They're too hard. And I'm like, what? And I try and use them and I'm like, dude, they are hard to squeeze. So make sure they're kid friendly. I got these as well. These are littler and little hand friendly because because you want to get stuff that the kids don't need you for, right? Because the whole idea is, and I'll emphasize this a little bit later, the whole idea is not to do this stuff with your kids necessarily, but to get them um, functional so they have plenty of things to play and build with outside without you. And here's this last little thing. This, I think these are called, there's a name, uh, night ties. Anyway, they're, um, they're bendable, coated in rubber. I think there's a metal interior and they just, they're like, they're like a bread twist tie on steroids. And so you can, they're easy enough for the kids to twist around as well. Fine motor skills. This is good for kid development right here. And then I like to put out some fabric too, fun fabric for them to build with. Kids really love this kind of stuff where you can see through it. Um, but it still provides kind of a, a boundary, kind of makes them feel like they're in a fort. Um, for the older ones, I like to get uh, like a, a tarp um, or some sort of like a drop cloth like this and then cut it up into sections. If you want to get super fancy, you can even get um, a box of grommets. You guys know what grommets are? They're like the little holes at the corner of the tarps. You can get one of these. I forget these. This kit is probably like ten dollars, and it's got a hundred and fifty grommets or something, and the little tool to put them in. So you just punch the grommets in each corner, and that way the kids can um, take their rope and just feed it through the hole and tie it to a fence post or bamboo poles if you have those. So much fun! All right, so I think did I hit up everything in my loose parts? I think I did. Um, the next thing is screens. Now, I know this is controversial. We all hear about all the screen time that our kids are getting that we shouldn't be letting them get. And I agree in theory. I also um, think that it's okay sometimes to have your screens outside. Right now I have my screen outside. Um, I would be doing this webinar and on my screen whether or not I was outside. So I may as well be outside and get some nature time while I'm here. Um, we've done a lot of fun stuff where we put our we put our TV outside on the deck for um, family movie night or for a couple of days we'll move like the kids little uh, video game system out there. So if they want to go play video games, it's it's outside and it just mixes it up and it makes it fun and exciting to go outside. Um, I think in in the conservation or nature education field, there's a lot of talk about why we need to get outside instead instead of spending time on screens. But I think that sets up um, a conflict that doesn't necessarily need to be there. So don't be afraid to take your screens outside. All right, so that was tip two. Let's see, add water carefully. So you guys might know this already, um, but there's something about adding water to um, already existing toys that your kids have already been playing with that makes it like double or triple the fun that it originally was. Um, I don't know what that is, but but I even see it for myself when when I would be hanging out with my kids and playing with stuff. Water always makes it more fun. So um, so I have had several fails, some epic fails when it comes to this. So I'll give you an example of some of the things I tried that don't work in terms of water. Um, I initially just hooked up a hose and left it outside with my kids and they had fun. It was just out there running. They, they came in, I don't know, half an hour later and I didn't think anything of it. And then four hours later, I went to start the washing machine and the water was running really slow into the washer. And then I start yelling at the kids, hey, did you turn off the hose? 
what do you mean, mom? Oh, so, so I think it uh, can be said that we should probably not rely on our children to remember to turn off hoses on their own. So I was like, okay, I'll just put a little spray nozzle on it. Well, that was also a mistake because let me tell you, there's something so enticing about a spray nozzle and other children that your kid just can't resist spraying them. And then the screaming starts because somebody got sprayed by this and that, and then that was also a total, um, total mess. Now, then I was like, well, what if I just get a certain amount of water and I'll set it out and then they can get it as they need it. So I got a big, um, big bucket and I put it outside. Well, that lasted 15 seconds before somebody thought it was a great idea to dump it all out because it's, again, it's a kid impulse control. They just can't help but just want to just dump a whole bucket of water, which I mean, it's fun. I agree. So what I finally settled on was, um, was were things that were both contained and slow to dispense. Okay, so a limited amount, and then things that could have uh, could only trickle out the water. And one of the perfect examples of what you can use for that is a drink dispenser. So you fill it up and put the top on it, and then you set it somewhere, like on a pile of bricks or on a step or somewhere, and then the kids can just help themselves to water. It comes out like. Um, pretty slow, so they can't assault other kids with it. And then um, you can either say when it's gone, it's gone, or when it's gone, um, you have to come get me. Lots of ways to go on this. Um, I'll also say I don't have it handy because it's kind of put up for the time being, but I also got a 55 gallon drum and I got a hand pump that fit in top, uh, fit in the top through one of the holes um, from like the water, treatment and chemical industry. I mean, they're not that expensive. These little hand pumps, they're, they're rotary cranks and the kids love that too. So if you're feeling like you want to go all out, that might be an idea for you. Um, so that was the first little bullet spigots. Spigots are your friend. Um, and the second is you need to make sure this sounds easy and this sounds like a no brainer, but I have lived through, um, I have lived through some things with when I've forgotten to do this, you need to waterproof the area. You need to assume that everything that could possibly get wet will get wet. And then you need to be okay with each of those things getting wet or else you need to move them. So that way you're not setting up the kids for, um, for failure. Okay, so tip number four, find other kids. So a key part of play um, is kids playing with other kids. And even if you have a ton of awesome loose parts and uh, water spigots all over the place, sometimes that just seems like it's not quite enough and they get lonely and then they get bored and then they start whining. And I, I don't hold it against them, I would whine too. And so um, just by bringing in other kids into the mix, it does wonders. Now there's a few ways you can do this, um, you could put, fun stuff in your own backyard. If you have access to uh, your own backyard or your own green space outside, um, if you're in an apartment, for example, and then you invite um, your kid to go outside and uh, arrange for the other kids in the area or your, your kid's friends to come on over for a play date of sorts. Um, you could also just plan to do a meetup at a park or a nature preserve. You know, it's kind of boring sometimes when kids go to nature preserves and they don't have friends that come along with them because they're they're fun to explore. Um, adults tend to like them more than kids do, but once there are multiple kids and they can start going and messing in the streams and in the creeks, they have a great time. So that's another idea. Um, and then the second bullet, ask around to find uh, the kid nature hotspots. So this one, um, I haven't come up to speed on all of the spots in Loudoun, but um, in Washington State, which is where I moved back from uh, a few years ago, I had connected with other moms, other parents through the, you know, the informal mom parent network to find out, well, where do people go when they want to go play outside? Um, because it's not necessarily listed out in, uh, you know, the parks brochure. We're talking about um, maybe state parks that have uh, a stream with a 
a gentle sloping pebble area where it's kid friendly. So I have heard of a few places around here. Um, one of them is actually across the river in Maryland, Frederick County, the Catoctin Creek Nature Center. There's a stream, I want to say an eighth of a mile from the parking lot that is super fun. And in the summer, plenty of parents that bring their kids down there. And then I've also heard about Dinosaur Park in Ashburn, um, that there's a naturalized area that a lot of people uh, like to go play around in, kind of separate from the playground installations. Um, ideally, I'd love to put together some sort of a guide, a resource guide for parents so that they know where to find the other kids that also want to be out in nature playing. Okay, then let's see. Tip number five, back away slowly. So this took me a very long time to learn. And in fact, I think I'm still learning it. I think that's because it's so contrary to what we often hear um, in terms of parenting advice, especially in, in this area where there's such a focus on achievement um, and excellence in terms of academics. Um, if you think about it, the work of childhood is play. And so we need to let them do their work without necessarily being interrupted. When they're in the flow, let them go. I know that's really cheesy, but it's sometimes easy to think of that simple statement to just give yourself permission to not turn everything into a teachable moment um, so that you're not necessarily trying to bust in there to encourage the STEM, cell, STEM skills or you know correcting the social behavior that wasn't quite as nice as it could be. You just kind of need to back away and and let them get in their groove. And if you watch them, which I encourage you to do, you know, I'm not saying that you need to like pack up your stuff and 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 head down the street. You know, just sit back quietly, try to make your presence not overbearing. And um, if you sit back and you watch them, you'll see that they kind of they're getting in a groove. It's kind of like I equate it to to adults when they get in the groove. Let's say when they're when they're creating art, if they're painting, or um, even in the workplace, you know, as an engineer. So when I would get in the middle of doing calculations or working on my um, my typing plans, and then my boss would come by and say something or make a suggestion about something I had done. I mean, it would totally disrupt my flow, and it would take me so long to get back into it. And if you think about kids while they're playing, this is they're also in that flow doing their work. Um, being creative, experimenting with things. And then an adult comes along and tells them, well, why don't you try putting uh, this rock in there? Do you notice it's heavier? You know, well, I mean, I know it's well intended, but tailoring a different concept and working on what they were working on. And then that moment for them is lost. So it's frustrating. So that is tip number five. This is your official. Um, permission to back away from the child and not, and and still feel that you're being a good parent by letting them explore on their own. And then I threw this one in um, for my last slide. So how can you tell that you're doing it right? <laughs> and I like to use performance based measures, which means you just look at how everything is turning out to see whether you've done the process correctly or not. So if you're outside and no one is yelling or crying, then that means that you have done it correctly. <laughs> And you get even more bonus points for smiles and laughter. Okay. And I also want to make sure that you guys, as you as you start taking some of these ideas and applying them yourselves in your own backyard with your own kids, um, that you don't feel pressure to do it or to be successful with it. You're not you're not allowed to take these ideas and be stressed out about trying to do them perfectly. You know, this is if it's not working, you know what you do? You just pack it in. Um, and you call it a day and then you think about it for a couple days and think about what you could try next time, maybe switching out loose parts, maybe uh, doing it a different time of day, maybe taking snacks because snacks are often the answer for everything. Um, and you try it again and you know what, if it fails again, it fails again. One of my favorite sayings is um, try again, fail again, fail better, you know, because it's never going <laughs> to. It's a process. Parenthood is a process. All right. 
So I think that was it. I wanted to open it up for questions and I'd be happy to answer any questions about any of the loose parts or any other questions that you guys have. Thanks so much, Megan. And yeah, if you have any questions about um, anything Megan spoke about or anything else related, please feel free to put them in the chat or let us know you'd like to be unmuted. That was some great advice though, Megan. Thank you. Yeah. It's not as hard as you think. Talk about how um, creativity is helpful to developing stem cells because people often think to develop stem cells it's, um, skills, it's mostly about <laughs> math, learning math and science, but how does the creative play? Oh, play I think it's it? critical. Uh, honestly, I think it's I think it's critical because so much of um, my engineering job, right? When I was in there, it it wasn't doing calculate. I mean, I thought that calculations were fun, and but it was a rarity that I got to do them. Um, so much more of it is um, problem solving skills and um, planning, execution. You know, trying to come up with uh, answers to problems that you haven't necessarily encountered before. So being out in nature and having all of these things to manipulate and to work on spatial relations and, you know, to um, understand cause and effect and flow rates of water. You know, a lot of kids like to to dig little um, dig little channels and then pour water through and see how it flows. I mean, I think these are all creative things that they're doing and they're just learning so much about the world when they do it. Okay, and I see that someone has um, his or her hand raised, Sham, so I'll get to you in just a second. Um, one question came in before that. What do you do if the child looks stymied? Is it okay to suggest things? Yeah, yeah. Um, one of the things that I uh, like to do with uh, the Play Rangers, that's the name of the, the folks that work with me at Loudon Wildlife who are there to facilitate free play sessions that we do, um, but they, they have several roles, they put on different hats and it's important as you're, when you're observing to notice when a child is stuck. Um, there's a couple different ways you can do it. Um, one thing is you can just start playing with the loose parts on your own and they get curious and they come over. Um, another thing is you can say, hey, I found these things over here. Did you want these? Um, lots of ways that you can kind of try to unstick them without necessarily giving them an assignment. I guess that's how I put it. So either more as a collaborator or more as just like a, a supply officer. Great, good advice. And Shams, do you, did you have a question you wanted to ask? Uh, yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sure. Uh, Lauren. Uh, Ms. Uh, <coughs> Goldman, uh, I have a, a vice versa question. My uh, my kids love to go uh, to outside. So in Virginia, there is no park lift that I take them out. When I take them out <laughs> after three hours or sometimes four hours, I have two kids, three years and and uh, three is getting four and four is getting five. When they're getting outside, when I'm saying, okay, five minutes, we let's go home, it's late, they are not going home. Mm -hmm. And I have uh, this uh, problem and they keep crying. Yes, my children do the same thing still, and they're 10 and 12. <laughs> um, I think uh, I usually like to build something in that seems, oh, I feel like I'm going against the title of my slides without bribes or tears, but I do like to build in something fun for them to look forward to when they leave. Um, the other thing is if you're out there with other kids, uh, let's say you've met friends out, out there or they've become friends with uh, random other kids on the playground, mm -hmm. you uh, team up and you do it as a group. So when the other people leave, you leave. You know, you can approach the other parent and be like, okay, we're going to make a break for it together. Um, I found that that works. Um, but I, I think what I did most often was just say, okay, well, we're going to stop for such and such on the way home. Or when we get home, we'll do this and this kind of give them something 
um, to look forward to when when they do go home. You also want to make sure you leave um, before they get to that stage where they're just uh, a total train wreck, right? Because it's easy for them to get tired without realizing it when they're outside and running around. And so you want to make sure that you don't get them so worn out and just delirious with exhaustion that you can't even deal with them. Uh, yeah, how yeah. about to like a transition project? So uh, you say like, OK, you know, we, we're going to wrap it up. So let's, you know, find something to take back with us as a memory of this date. Yeah, and if I bring home a little rock or a pretty leaf or something and a race to the car. Yeah, yeah. Anything else, Tom's? Uh, no, no, thank you. Uh, yeah, I'm using this type of tips uh, when I had to bring them uh, home. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, it is a hard. I know. I will uh, send you more uh, questions to your email. Sure, I'd, I'd be happy to. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Kind of a good problem to have, though, that your kids don't you want know. to come outside. <laughs> 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 Anybody else have any questions for Megan? Are there any um, citizen science or outdoor projects uh, or groups that you can recommend getting? Yeah, well, first I would be selfish and like to recommend my own. <laughs> um, I this would be a good a good point in time to tell you guys about some of the stuff we did during the pandemic. Um, you know, we stopped having in person programs, and so we worked uh, on infrastructure because, as I mentioned before, a lot of the nature spaces. They're not particularly welcoming to kids. They're kind of set up for people that hike or people that um, nature watch, which kids, I mean, there are there are kids who like doing it with their parents, but um, on the whole, kids like running around and being crazy and playing with stuff. So we put together a nature play space out at, um, it is in Western Loudoun, so I know that's pretty far for some of you guys. Um, it's at the Blue Ridge Center for Environmental Stewardship which is out um, near Hillsboro. And we put out there oh, a bunch of stuff that's right near um, the main the main trailhead. Oh, thanks, Lorraine. Yep, that's it. And there's uh, twig teepees, there's fairy houses, there's a dig pit with a bunch of shovels and buckets. There's um, a couple mud kitchens. There's a little nature stage. There's a bunch of stumps and logs and whatnot, so you can build an obstacle course. And we're always going out there and working on um, new elements. So that is open every day from dusk to dawn, and it's free for you guys to go out there if you want to check it out. We are having on July the 17th, kind of like an open house, a get outside and play day out there um, from 9 a.m. to noon. And then we are going to start ramping up our in person programs. And so, what I do with Loudon Wildlife is uh, we have what's called the Play Rangers, which are volunteers who go out into green spaces and take a bunch of loose parts, such as the ones I've showed you, also cardboard, cardboard boxes are everybody's favorite. Um, and we set up in a green area and we just uh, invite the community particularly the kids, but parents are welcome too, as long as they're fun um, and to come play. And it's a great time and it gives the kids a chance to be outside and in their element. Cause I feel like a lot of times when we expect kids to be outside, um, they don't necessarily have much to do that's fun for them. So it's a, it's a great opportunity and you can follow us on Facebook or on um, our website to check out the offerings as they start popping up. But I can also fantastic talk about fantastic place and that's a nice little field trip. I remember there was a really great playground in Hamilton that was made from some local volunteers all out of wood. And, you know, even though it was, you know, maybe 35, 40 minutes for us to get there, it was really nice. We used to bring a picnic lunch and make an afternoon of it. And mm -hmm. the Blue Ridge Center for Environmental Stewardship sounds like a really special place. Mm -hmm. 
Um, at the nature play stations, what should the kids wear? Um, whatever they, my advice is, whatever that they're comfortable in, um, that the parents will be comfortable with getting dirty. Um, I am the kind of parent who I don't buy kids. I don't buy clothes for my kids that I expect to stay nice for any length of time. Um, because because it used to drive me crazy being so nervous about the clothes that they're wearing. No, don't get dirty or their shoes or stuff. So I just made a commitment after a certain number of years that they were just going to get, you know, all cotton, tough fabrics, everything hot washable. And we were just going to have to learn how to live that way. Um, some kids love being totally covered, you know, with long sleeves and um, pants on. You know, the the nature play area at Blue Ridge Center. It's in a grassy area. I mean, it's it's not um, and it's next to a tree line, so it's not like you're in backwoods country. But there are some kids who again like. They like to be covered a certain way and you know what? Whatever makes that kid comfortable is fine with me. There are also kids who love. Not having many clothes on um, and. <laughs> if it weren't for their parents. Um, being there and enforcing it, they probably wouldn't have any clothes on because they love to, you know, especially once the water starts flying everywhere. They're just so happy. They're like pigs in mud, and which is so fun to watch. But I understand we all have to have our boundaries <laughs> and underwear is the one we'd like to stick with. Do you have any advice for protecting kids against ticks when they're playing outside? That's a good question. So my. My method that I use with my kids is a nightly tick check, and it's just part of our routine every night when they get changed and ready for bed tick check. Um, and they know to. Check all of their bits and pieces and through their hair um, for ticks. Now, we don't use a lot of bug spray here, so that isn't something that our family does. I know that other families do. Um, my other big tip for that is to be careful about where you're going. There is a difference in the um, for the amount of ticks that will be in a certain area, and often it's related to how uh, how developed the area has been in the past. I know that doesn't that's not really clear. So for ticks, especially for ticks um, that are infected with Lyme disease or other other um, tick-borne diseases. Oftentimes they get uh, even more populated when only white mice are able to be in a certain habitat. So we're talking about um, a lot of grassy areas, but not a lot of forests, because what happens in a healthy forest ecosystem, you have squirrels, you have possums, raccoons, um, groundhogs, and all of those mammals, which also the ticks like to attach to, all of those types of mammals are better groomers than the mice. So what happens is when you have a disturbed ecosystem, somebody comes in and clears a forest, builds suburbs, um, and there's still a green area that's kind of um, in the center of it. If it's not big enough, like two to three <laughs> acres to have to support the the other mammals besides mice, you end up with an exploding tick population that often carries Lyme. So that's why I like Blue Ridge Center. You know, I'll go there and we'll rarely get a tick out there. Um, but then some of the other places that are um, closer towards Eastern Loudon and further in, I feel like the ticks are worse there. So it's counterintuitive, but it's all the more reason that we should be um, protecting our forests. Absolutely. Any other questions before we end the program? I do appreciate your doing this program for us, Megan. Yeah, it's really, I, th I, I think one nice thing about the um, about COVID is that you do see more kids outside now and everybody is outside more and it's really wonderful to see. And I think um, just to emphasize 
my emails up here. I'm happy to answer any questions one on one um, to set up any type of session for any groups, uh, parent groups or any type of community group that uh, might be interested in hearing more about this and how we can support kids um, as a community in getting outside and having access to green spaces, uh, whatever you'd like. I'm all about getting the kids outside and making parents less miserable, including myself. Thank you. Thank you, Megan, for all you do. We really appreciate your being here tonight. And thank you all for attending the program. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, guys. <laughs>